Since the dawn of man, he has battled to conquer enemy territory and defend his own. To emerge the victor in battle, he needed to move faster and hit harder than his enemy. The ability to move swiftly and strategically, meaning the difference between life and death. One horsepower became 16,000 as boats rolled straight out of the sea and onto the land. Vehicles became moving fortresses, their armament evolving in destructive power. Each machine had to be faster, stronger and more lethal than the one before. These new tools of war, the key to triumph on land. champion of military maneuverability since 1984. With an innovative design and range of equipment configurations, it has been employed as everything from a troop and weapons carrier through to a battlefield ambulance. The high mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicle, or Humvee, has been called a Jeep on steroids. But this revolutionary four-wheel drive is much more than a replacement for the Jeep. A jack of all trades, this tactical vehicle replaced a whole generation of combat trucks. The Humvee's proportions make it instantly recognisable, but its extreme width and low body are not for show. This critical design feature reduces the risk of potentially fatal rollovers common in its predecessors. During the War on Terror, the Humvee proved to be a valuable member of the Allied Forces battle fleet. With the ground clearance double that of a standard four-wheel drive, it excelled in the harsh desert conditions of Afghanistan and Iraq. Traversing at speeds over 113 kilometers per hour, the Humvee's body is comprised mostly of aluminium, lightening the vehicle's weight. This enables the Humvee to be delivered to any point on the battlefield by a sling load or airdrop. With a two and a half ton payload, the Humvee can be up armored with added protection or equipped with weapons such as anti-tank missiles for frontline combat. After more than 30 years of service, the US Army has begun to supplement the Humvee with a range of specialized vehicles due to evolving combat requirements. A new fleet of machines have joined the mission to master battlefield maneuverability. When America was ripped into civil war in 1861, the country was transitioning into a new age of technology. However, traditional cavalry units would still play a major role in the conflict. Union cavalry regiments were typically better equipped than their Confederate counterparts, as they were supplied with horses that met strict mandates of age, height and weight. In contrast, Confederate recruits were required to provide their own mounts but were widely considered to be superior horsemen to the urbanized soldiers from the north. However, the cavalry might of each side wouldn't be truly measured until the Battle of Brandy Station. In a surprise attack, a Union force that included 9,000 cavalry clashed with a Confederate army of equal strength. The battle was the largest cavalry engagement on American soil. After a day of fighting, with both sides sustaining heavy losses, the Union claimed victory. For the first time in the war, the Union cavalry had not only matched but surpassed their Confederate counterparts in horsemanship and maneuverability. The horse would continue as the superior machine of mobility well into the age of the internal combustion engine, and the United States Army would continue to use mounts right up to 1941. But as a mechanized Nazi army carved its way through Europe, 
the US military recognized the urgent need for an all-terrain vehicle for reconnaissance, supply, and troop transportation. A replacement for the horse that could challenge the German fleet, which included the Kubelwagen, a versatile vehicle already conquering the battlefield. Described by the US Army Chief of Staff as America's greatest contribution to modern warfare, Willie's MB was more commonly known as the Jeep. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. Designed by the American Bantam Company in 1941, the Jeep could achieve top speeds of 105 kilometers per hour. Powered with a 45 horsepower motor, a four wheel drive and six speeds forward and two reverse, they will go anywhere a tank can go and then some. The Jeep's brilliance lay in its simplicity and adaptability. With protruding front wheels and a snub nose, it was able to traverse steep inclines. The Jeep could carry a 300 kilo payload or tow half its own weight. At just over a ton, its light weight enabled it to be winched over obstacles or wrapped in canvas to traverse rivers. The modern army marches on its Jeep and they say there's nowhere a Jeep can't go. During the last major German offensive of World War II, Belgium's freezing conditions rendered most vehicles inoperable. The Jeep, however, was unstoppable. German command issued an order that any captured Jeeps should replace the Kubelwagen, which could not stand up to its US counterpart. After the Allies claimed victory over Nazi Germany, General Dwight Eisenhower named the Jeep as one of the three tools that won the war. Continuing service for another 30 years, the Jeep had one fatal flaw, its tendency to roll over. By the 1980s, the Jeep was retired and replaced with the Humvee. Although by this time, the Jeep had more than earned its stripes, exceeding its original wartime mission to be a motorized version of the horse. During the Great War, the railways that crisscrossed Europe carried more troops and weaponry than ever before. But these veins of supply weren't a go-everywhere solution, requiring large amounts of infrastructure to reach constantly shifting battlefields. Horses remained the only true all-terrain transport, but they could be easily killed, were expensive to feed, and could cause disease amongst the troops. The internal combustion engine would change all of that. In February 1916, German troops marched through Belgium on foot to take the French city of Verdun. It would be the longest single battle of World War I with over 700,000 combined casualties. German forces had interrupted French railway lines, leaving French defenses with one sole lifeline a 72-kilometre stretch of road from Bar-le-Duc to Verdun that would become known as A Voie Sacre, the Sacred Road. Each week, over 3,500 trucks resupplied the French forces with 90,000 troops and 50,000 tonnes of ammunition. With German front lines increasingly out of reach of their train and horse supply systems, a critical shortage of drinking water, munitions and food would be their downfall. By December 1916, the French had recaptured much of the lost ground. The combustion engine influenced French victory, yet the adoption of the motor vehicle in wartime was slow. It would not be for another 20 years that the horse would be completely surpassed when the British Army became history's first completely motorised army in 1939.
In the war on terror, Allied troops battling insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan were routinely attacked with improvised explosive devices and roadside bombs. This type of asymmetrical warfare, where terrorist and guerrilla groups battle traditional armed forces with vastly different strategies, had been on the rise since the Vietnam War. With the legendary Humvee susceptible to explosive attacks, the US military needed a new fleet of armoured vehicles. The mine-resistant Ambush Protected Vehicle, or MRAP, is not a singular machine, but a team of multi-mission vehicles specifically engineered to save the lives of troops. The MRAP's V-shaped hull deflects explosive forces, directing the firepower outwards, away from the troops inside. A raised chassis elevates the vehicle higher above the blast zone. Their armour plating and blast-resistant glass were engineered with one mission in mind, to reduce fatalities of Allied soldiers. In 2004, almost 70% of US casualties in the Middle East were caused by IEDs. By 2007, troops protected in MRAPs suffered only 6% casualties. All categories of MRAP are capable of speeds up to 104 kilometers per hour, enabling them to keep pace with combat vehicles. Some have remote weapon systems, allowing a gunner to fire off rounds without being exposed to the enemy. But all its protection comes at a heavy cost. MRAPs have limited off-road capabilities, can struggle fitting into constricted urban areas, and 72% of all bridges around the world cannot hold their weight. As coalition forces withdrew from the Middle East, the US Army believed the MRAP to be no longer feasible for combat. The MRAP has, however, earned its place in history, not just a sophisticated tool of military maneuverability, but for the thousands of lives saved traversing the most dangerous war zones on Earth. To triumph on land, armies need more than just superior means of maneuverability and supply. They need an unrivaled combination of mobility, protection and pure firepower. In frontline combat, the weapon of choice for armed forces around the globe is the iconic tank. Since the first behemoths crawled towards the German lines, military developers have been on a never-ending quest to reach the pinnacle of armoured, mobile firepower. Engaged in battle in every climate and terrain on Earth, there is nowhere that a tank cannot or will not go. Charging the front line in modern ground force attacks is the main battle tank, a machine with the heaviest armament and protection, but superior mobility. With the capability of firing a nine kilogram projectile at speeds over one and a half kilometers per second, destroying targets over three kilometers away, the Leopard 2 is one of the leading tanks in its class. When it was unveiled by the German army in 1979, the Leopard 2 was the most advanced tank in the world, featuring the perfect balance of firepower, mobility and protection. It can engage enemy targets with pinpoint accuracy, destroying moving adversaries while traversing through terrain using laser rangefinders and sophisticated stabilization digital fire control systems. Reactive armor protects the Leopard 2 against all known anti-tank weapons. When hit by an RPG or missile, a top layer of explosive flyer plates detonate. This outward blast drives the projectile's energy away from the tank, stopping it from penetrating the vehicle's armor. The Leopard 2 is a supreme example of evolution and ingenuity. With plans to keep them in service until 2030, the Leopard 2 series of tanks will earn their place in history as heroes of battlefield firepower. On the Western Front in 1916, Allied forces and the German army were embroiled in one of the bloodiest battles in history. 
Determined to end the deadlock and crush through Germany's line of trenches, the British Army embarked on a top-secret program that would change the face of battle forever. On September 15, during the Battle of the Somme, the British tank made its debut. The first in a line of modified versions, moving at only six kilometers per hour, the British Army's Mark I was not designed for speed. The mission of the tanks was to cut through the hail of machine gun fire, crush the barbed wire, and allow infantry to break through the German line. In 1916, many of the German army had never seen a motor vehicle, let alone a tank. At the sight of a Mark I rolling toward him, a German soldier shouted, the devil is coming. 49 tanks were engaged in their inaugural battle, and although most were destroyed, Allied forces would cross the German line to liberate the French town of Fleurs. But for all the advantages the line of British tanks provided, there were as many drawbacks new, unproven weaponry, tanks had been rushed into battle. Sir Winston Churchill, a longtime champion of tank development, said, my poor land battleships have been let off prematurely on a petty scale. The tanks were mechanically unreliable and prone to breakdowns. Initially, conditions for the eight men inside were horrific. With the engine seated in the middle, nothing separated it from the crew. Temperatures could reach a scorching 50 degrees Celsius. The noise from inside the tank, combined with the sound of bullets hailing down on the armour outside, was deafening. When the tanks were hit with machine gun fire, searing fragments of armour would fly around inside the hull, so troops had to wear protective leather and chainmail masks to avoid injury. Leaking poisonous gases would often lead entire crews to lose consciousness, and a direct hit by a grenade could cause the fuel tanks to burst open incinerating anyone inside. But the British Army was convinced that the tanks were the key to victory and development charged ahead. Whilst the British worked continuously on rolling out improved versions of the tank, the French toiled on their own designs for mobile armoured firepower. With armament encased in a 360 degree rotating turret and an internally divided hull that placed the engine at the rear and the crew at the front, the Renault FT set the standard for tank layouts of the future. Developed in 1916, the blueprint is still used in today's modern tanks. At a mere 6.5 tonnes and only requiring a two-man crew to operate, the Renault FT was considerably smaller than its British counterpart. The combat strategy behind the FT was to swarm the battlefield and overwhelm combatants by sheer force of numbers. Renault produced over 3,000, with most entering service in 1918. But by the time the bulk of the FTs rolled off the production line, the war was over. They were later used in World War II, but by this time, their technology was obsolete, and the FT was no match for the new breed of battle tanks. Germany's World War I defeat by the Allied forces was a failure that Adolf Hitler vowed he would avenge. His obsession with creating the ultimate mobile armoured fighting force would lead to a type of warfare that would change history. On January 11, 1934, the German Army Weapons Department was tasked with designing the primary battle tank of the Nazi forces. Intended for tank-on-tank -tank combat, the resulting Panzerkampfwagen, commonly known as the Panzer III, would become a symbol of Blitzkrieg. Germany's lightning war strategy was designed to pummel the enemy with mass concentrations of tank firepower, followed by mechanized infantry assaults and reinforced by artillery and air attacks. Unlike most tanks during the Second World War, the Panzer III had an intercom system and radio communications capabilities, invaluable for coordinated attacks. But as the war continued, it was clear that the Allied tanks outpassed the Panzer III, both in firepower and armour. During Operation Barbarossa, Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, 
the Panzer III's took their place among 3,600 Nazi tanks. The Panzers held their own against the bulk of the Russian armoured forces, but the German Panzer crews soon discovered the Soviet T-34s. The T-34s possessed unprecedented high-velocity anti-tank firepower and seemingly impenetrable armour. Angled at a slope, the heavy armour often deflected rounds away from the tank. When German tank general von Kleist first encountered the T-34, he called it the finest tank in the world. The Panzer III was simply no match. Yet it was not the T-34 that would prove to be the Panzer III's greatest adversary. Germany simply did not have the resources necessary to sustain the attack on the Russians. Oil reserves were severely depleted and fuel, ammunition and troops were running out. Ill-equipped to continue fighting in the bitter Russian winter, the offensive froze to a halt. The Panzer III's final defeat would come at the hands of an enemy that could not be fired upon. The freezing cold. Inhospitable terrain and extreme climates are a brutal reality of land-based combat and after World War II, new tank design focused not only on improvements in firepower but also on increased mobility and adaptability. During the 1960s, the United States Army issued a daunting challenge. They wanted an amphibious tank, light enough to be airlifted but with the strength and power to tackle a main battle tank. The United States Army's M551 Sheridan would charge into the Vietnam War in 1969. It is fast, highly maneuverable, and mounts a weapon system that will destroy any known armor. The Sheridan was designed to be landed by parachute and to swim across rivers. Its mobility was excellent in all terrains. Eventually, all cavalry squadrons were equipped with the all-terrain vehicle with a speed of 70 kilometers per hour on land and 5.8 in water. Infantry troops, who were desperate for direct fire support, praised the Sheridan, but command was critical of the Sheridan's vulnerability to landmines and rocket-propelled grenades. Often, casualties of a Viet Cong RPG ambush, the Sheridan's aluminium body was reported to almost melt in the attack. However, the gun provided to be an effective anti-personnel weapon and the Sheridan continued to fulfill reconnaissance, night patrol and road clearing duties in Vietnam until the 10th of April 1972 when the last US armoured cavalry unit prepared for redeployment back to the United States. Whilst Hitler's blitzkrieg was cutting through Europe, British tank design had languished. The Churchill III, initially designed for trench warfare, was heavy, slow and undergunned. In the new age of mobile warfare, it was no match for the speed and firepower of the German panzers. The British Army knew they would need a superior tank if they were to defeat the Third Reich. A new and improved Churchill Mark III was built, armed with a 57mm main gun. With a top speed of only 24 kilometers per hour, compared to the Panzer III's 40, it was still slow. But these were desperate times for the British, and so the Churchill was sent to North Africa for the Second Battle of El Alamein. The Churchill proved to be an unlikely hero, displaying extraordinary hill-climbing ability over the African dunes. What it lacked in speed, it made up for in its survivability on the battlefield. Its 102 mm thick armour withstood heavy punishment. Although the Churchill was thriving in North Africa, Britain was still desperately short on tanks. The fleet was boosted by the arrival of the USA's newly introduced medium tank, which troops called the General Sherman. Designed by the US Army Ordnance Department in 1940, the relative ease of production allowed huge numbers to be manufactured, as many as 2,000 per month. 
with a fully traversing turret and a main 75mm gun, the Sherman would go on to become one of the most prolific tanks of World War II. While neither tank was perfect, together the Churchill and the Sherman were greater than the sum of their parts. With the Churchill's strength and agility and the Sherman's speed and firepower, they quickly proved to be an unbeatable combination against the Axis tanks. None of Rommel's tricks and none of his much-boosted weapons could stop the British and American tanks during those days of fierce fighting that led to the big breakthrough. The Churchill and the Sherman defied all odds and crushed the Axis tanks. The victory was a major morale boost both on the battlefield and the home front and would be a decisive turning point in the war. As Winston Churchill himself famously said, before Alamein, we never had a victory. After Alamein, we never had a defeat. Since their inception, tanks have become one of the most dominant weapons on the battlefield. Equipped with the world's most sophisticated technology, they are faster, stronger and more accurate than ever before. Setting new standards in design, armament, protection and electronics is the American third generation main battle tank, the M1 Abrams. Recognising the invaluable knowledge of tank crews, the US government asked experienced operators to participate in the Abrams design process during the 1970s. Powered by a 1500 horsepower multi-fuel turbine jet engine, the Abrams weighs over 62 tonnes. Equipped with thermal imaging sights, Abrams crews can seek, find and engage enemy targets in darkness and low visibility. The Abrams long-range gunnery capability allows the tank to strike targets up to three kilometres away, even while on the move, with a computerised stabilisation system keeping the gun platform steady at all times. The 120mm main gun's four types of ammunition are stored in a blast-proof chamber at the back of the turret, protected by blowout panels, providing greater crew safety. While exact specifications are classified top secret, the Abrams sophisticated composite armour is a mix of steel, ceramic, uranium and Kevlar, a synthetic woven fibre that is five times as strong as steel. The armour is so advanced that the M1 is capable of withstanding a direct hit from an anti-tank explosive or kinetic energy round. Designed during the Cold War, the first Abrams tank came off the Chrysler defence production line in 1978. For over 10 years, the M1 remained untested in combat until Operation Desert Storm in 1991. Over 1,800 M1A1s were deployed to fight Saddam Hussein's forces, armed with Russian-bought T-72s. After the initial airstrikes, the untested Abrams were placed on the front line. Tank on tank, the T-72s were no match. At the end of the skirmish, Kuwait was liberated without a single loss of life amongst American tank crews. An ever-evolving fighting machine, the Abrams is constantly being upgraded with the latest in technological advances, allowing it to continue as the main battle tank of the United States Army for decades to come. The onset of mechanised warfare in World War I not only changed the way wars were fought, it also spurred development of mobile fighting machines. An army can only move as fast as its slowest unit, and mechanising the infantry would be the key to triumph. Armoured personnel carriers provided troops with mobility, protection and armament on transit to the battlefield. But as arms developed, they soon evolved into infantry fighting machines. During the Cold War, the United States Army commissioned an infantry fighting vehicle, or IFV, that would be fast enough to keep pace with the Abrams tank, allowing both vehicles to work in formation during combat. In 1981, the M2 Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle was introduced. With a 600 horsepower turbo diesel engine, the Bradley rapidly transports a crew of three, as well as six fully equipped infantrymen. High performance shock absorbers prevent injury to troops during transport. But more than just a battle taxi, the Bradley sports a main 25mm chain gun firing 200 rounds per minute. 
It can also be armed with optically tracked anti-tank missiles, making it a highly effective tank killer. Specifically designed to penetrate armour, the TOW missile travels at the speed of sound, using an optical sensor to correct its trajectory to a target over three and a half kilometres away. During the Bradley's first deployment in the Gulf War, it destroyed more tanks than the M1 Abrams. While serving in Iraq, asymmetrical warfare initially proved a challenge for the Bradley, vulnerable to anti-tank weapons. Receiving constant upgrades, the Bradley gained the same explosive reactive armour as the Leopard 2 and Abrams tanks. Since 2007, the United States Army has favoured the use of MRAPs over the Bradley, but with more than 6,000 seen combat over the past 35 years, the M2 Bradley has proven to be a fearsome fighting machine. After the dawn of mechanised warfare, the British Army needed a versatile, armoured vehicle to swiftly deliver troops and equipment into the heart of battle. At only 157 centimetres tall and 206 wide, it was easy to underestimate the British Universal Carrier. 113,000 carriers were built for service between 1934 and 1960 and it remains the most produced armoured fighting vehicle in history. Often serving as a machine gun platform and commonly armed with the .303 Bren, the vehicle was commonly referred to as the Bren Gun Carrier. It's a machine war and Britain's growing mechanised army is hard at work. With only 7 to 10 millimetres of protection, the carrier was too lightly armoured to perform as a tank. However, it proved invaluable in an infantry support role. Powered by an 85 horsepower V8 petrol engine, the carrier would deliver troops to the battlefield where they would dismount to engage the enemy. As a general rule, the Bren gun is not fired from the carrier, which is merely used to rush up heavy firepower to the vital spot. The carrier displayed remarkable agility, its small size and advantage as a go-anywhere vehicle. Capable of reaching 48 kilometres per hour, it was fast for its time. Even the German army recognised the virtue of the universal carrier. Many were abandoned in France after the Blitzkrieg attacks and German forces made their own modifications, repurposing the carriers for reconnaissance and patrol. It also served as an artillery tractor due to a towing attachment that allowed it to haul Britain's main 57mm anti-tank gun. Bren carriers have already proved their value under modern conditions and wherever the British Army fights, there they'll be found on the job. Although one of the first armoured personnel carriers to ever go into battle, the Universal Carrier is still revered to this day as an unlikely hero of World War II and the forefather of APCs to come. In the 1950s, at the request of the United States Army, the Food Machinery Corp developed an all-terrain machine that would become one of the most successful armoured vehicles of all time. Entering service in 1962 against the Communist forces of North Vietnam and the Viet Cong, the M113 armoured personnel carrier received a fiery baptism. The natural barriers and unfriendly terrain in Vietnam make it tough for today's modern machines of war. But surprisingly, American mechanised units have surmounted these obstacles through ingenuity and sheer determination. Powered by a V6 two-stroke diesel engine, the M113 could reach speeds of 68 kilometres per hour on land. It was also partially amphibious, capable of crossing small rivers with the tracks providing propulsion. When the enemy can be anywhere, armour means a lot to the foot soldier. The M113 was constructed with aluminium. Lighter than steel, it was thick enough to protect the two crew and 11 troops against small arms fire. But at 18 tons, it was still agile. However, the widespread use of landmines revealed a fatal flaw in the strength of the M113's underbelly. And attacks from an RPG would ignite the vehicle instantly, 
Rather than risk being incinerated in an aluminium coffin, troops would ride on top during transit, leaving them completely exposed to the enemy. The loss of troop lives necessitated immediate improved protection for the M113, which was provided in the form of two shielded machine guns for the left and right rear positions and steel plate belly armour that covered the underside of the vehicle. Today's mechanised cavalry means mobility and speed, a prime requirement of modern warfare. Despite its shortcomings, the versatility of the M113 has kept it in active service. With an inexhaustible range of variants constituting half of the US armoured vehicle fleet. In 2007, the US Army began replacing M113s with the M2 Bradley. Yet their versatility means that large numbers will remain in a variety of support roles. One of the most widely used armoured fighting vehicles of all time, over 80,000 M113s have been produced since 1960. The 21st century warfare has demanded rapid advancements in armoured personnel carriers. Reinventing armed and armoured mobility, the Stryker is the most advanced armoured fighting vehicle on today's battlefield. Designed for the United States Army, the Stryker blurs the lines between heavy and light vehicles moving infantry to the battlefield quickly and securely whilst providing firepower for the squad during dismounted assault. When the first striker brigades were deployed in Iraq, the vehicle caused controversy due to its use of wheels instead of tracks. Whilst tracks offer superior off-road capabilities, the eight-wheeled striker is easier to maintain and can travel at 100 kilometers per hour, faster than any other armored fighting vehicle in history. The Stryker can operate as an 8x4 or can be switched to an all-wheel drive. A state-of-the-art system enables the tyres to be inflated or deflated according to speed, terrain and weather conditions. Should any tyre blow, the Stryker can keep moving thanks to the run-flat system of inner tubes. Even with all eight tyres flat, the Stryker can keep moving at speeds of up to 80 km per hour. Light and mobile, Stryker Brigade combat teams are capable of being rapidly deployed over long distances and are immediately battle ready on arrival. With 10 different variants of Stryker available, each company can tailor their configuration of vehicles according to the mission objective. Most Stryker variants are not designed to engage heavily armoured combatants, so the Stryker provides lighter protection than a tank for the two crew and nine troops inside. When it comes to armament, the striker teams can call in the right variant to provide the necessary firepower. This allows striker teams to combine heavy weaponry with the mobility that a lighter vehicle affords. The striker can be fitted with a 105 mm cannon, equal to the firepower of an M1 Abrams, and the largest gun ever fitted to a mechanized infantry vehicle. During its service over the last decade, the Stryker has proven to be the most sophisticated armoured fighting vehicle in the world today. Triumph on land has always required different means of deployment and an assault from the sea has often turned the tide of warfare. The armoured amphibious vehicles would evolve just as other species had done for millions of years before it, making the journey from the sea to the land all the while growing more powerful and advanced. Demands placed on modern amphibious assault vehicles are as extensive as they are daunting, required to operate in oceans and rivers as well as harsh off-road terrain and need to handle scorching desert heat or temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. The current amphibious assault vehicles of the United States Marine Corps not only meets these demands, it exceeds them. With the success or failure of an amphibious assault hinging on the initial landing, the crucial role of the contemporary AAV is to spearhead the mission, securing the beach before charging inland. 
The AAV's boat-like hull and water jet propulsion system allow it to travel at 13 kilometers per hour in water with standing three meter swells. When transitioning from water to land, track suspension allows the vehicle to operate over reefs and other obstructions that would be impossible for a lesser landing craft. Once on land, the AAB, operated by a three-man crew, becomes an armoured personnel carrier for 21 Marines, capable of a top speed of 72 kilometres per hour. During battle, it provides troops with combat support and is armed with a 12.7mm machine gun and a grenade launcher that can hit targets 1.5 kilometres away. The evolution of the AAV has been ongoing for more than 40 years. Spearheading an attack from the waves, the AAV will continue to provide armoured protection on the battlefield for decades to come. After the deadly Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor, the United States was forced to enter a war that it had tried to avoid. The Americans knew that defeating the Japanese would require victory over the other Axis powers of Germany and Italy. Amphibious assaults would be essential on every battlefront, requiring a seaworthy troop and transportation carrier to bridge the gap between ship and shore. Designed in April 1942 and created in just 38 days, the first amphibious wheeled military vehicle was deployed. At first, it was known only by its production code acronym, DUKW. The troops simply called it the Duck. Forging a watertight hull with seals on all bearings, a rudder for steering in water and a propeller for propulsion, the six-wheeled military supply truck was converted to an amphibious vehicle. The Duck was not armoured. If the hull was breached, a bilge pump would keep the craft afloat. Initially, the duck was met with enormous scepticism from the military, with many convinced it could neither be effective on land or water. But on the 10th of July, 1943, over 900 ducks went into battle for the first time during the Allied invasion of Sicily. With the large ships beached away from the Sicilian shore and a storm ensuing, the ducks operated as a ferry service. Straight from ship to beach, and then on by road to our advanced dumps. Yes, the ducks are playing a vital part in the smooth working of our supply organisation. The invasion of Sicily was a success for the Allies, who are now on the edge of mainland Europe. General Eisenhower praised the ducks' role in the campaign. In a report to Washington, he called for a commendation for the officer responsible for its development. Eventually, the duck's design incorporated the Spears device, allowing variance in tyre pressure to be controlled from the dashboard. The Duck was the first vehicle to allow the driver to vary the tyre pressure from inside the cab, a feature that is now standard on many military vehicles. The Duck would once again be put to the test during the greatest amphibious operation in history, the D-Day invasion of Normandy. During the operation, 40% of all supplies brought ashore were transported by the 2,000 ducks. They also acted as floating ambulances, ferrying the wounded from land to the hospital ships. Although the duck was only intended to last long enough to meet the demands of combat in World War II, the amphibious carrier surprised even its harshest critics. Amphibious assaults are widely acknowledged as some of the most difficult military operations. Painstaking coordination of air, land and sea vehicles must be undertaken and beach landings almost always encounter hostile enemy forces, not to mention natural barriers. While traditional landing craft are capable of accessing only 15% of the world's coastline, one amphibious assault vehicle is able to access 80. The motto of the crew operating the United States Navy's LCAC hovercraft is no beach is out of reach. The LCAC, or Landing Craft Air Cushion, is used to transport weapon systems, equipment, cargo and personnel, both from ship to shore and across the beach. It can carry 180 fully equipped troops or even an M1 Abrams tank. 
LCACs achieve extraordinary lifting power by efficiently channeling air. Powerful fans fill the hovercraft skirt. With enough pressure, the air escapes the skirt, lifting the hovercraft's fully laden 185 tonne weight. Four gas turbine engines, providing a total of 16,000 horsepower, propel the LCAC up to 75 kilometres per hour. While most amphibious assaults are made from between 1.5 and 3 kilometres offshore, the LCAC is capable of launching an assault from over the horizon. This gives troops unprecedented advantage as they advance on the enemy from a position that blurs the lines between sea and sky. Production ended in 2001 with a total of 91 LCACs delivered to the US Navy, each unit costing over 23 million US dollars. As the Navy's number of active LCACs decrease, they will make way for the amphibious war machines of the future. Nine hundred and twenty five kilometers off the Japanese coast lies the island of Iwo Jima. During the Pacific War, the island was a base for Japanese bombers. Heavily fortified, it was defended by around twenty three thousand Japanese troops who would protect it with deadly force. US armed forces had identified Iwo Jima as an ideal location from which to advance towards the Japanese mainland, so preparations for an amphibious attack on the island were made. Determined to be better equipped than on any other campaign in the Pacific, the Navy demanded a vehicle that would efficiently transition troops and cargo from the waters to the beach. The Landing Vehicle Tract, or LVT, was an amphibious supply and combat machine that would prove to be the backbone of the entire campaign. On February 19, 1945, the largest American naval force ever assembled in the Pacific began its attack on Iwo Jima. The LVT had the capacity to transport six crew and 30 troops. Powered by a seven-cylinder, 250 horsepower radial gasoline engine, it could reach speeds of up to 11 kilometers per hour in the water, charging to 40 kilometers on land. At first, the Americans faced minimal opposition from the Japanese. The ship-to-shore operation worked perfectly. But just over an hour after landing 8,000 troops ashore, the Japanese unleashed a murderous barrage of machine gun fire and heavy artillery upon the crowded beaches. Within the first few days of battle, the LVT would supersede its initial purpose, evolving into an assault vehicle. Armed with twin Browning machine guns, the vehicles worked in teams under a barrage of Japanese rocket and mortar fire. The first LVTs would send in artillery to soften the enemy. The second wave would follow up with infantry support. Unloading of supplies goes forward in the face of harassing fire and volcanic stands which retard the progress of rolling stock. After a savage battle that would last a month, costing the lives of 6,821 troops, and nearly 20,000 Japanese defenders. The Marines succeeded in seizing Iwo Jima. The LBT had proven a success, and the Battle of Iwo Jima would be remembered as one of the ultimate amphibious assaults. From what point is a modern amphibious assault launched? From where do landing craft disembark before delivering ground forces into enemy territory? Operated by the United States Navy, the WASP class are mighty amphibious assault ships and the first in history to allow for the operation of LCACs. Capable of launching 25 AAVs, three LCACs, a fleet of tanks and battle trucks and 2,200 combat ready troops, the WASP class are the ultimate platform for launching an amphibious assault. The WASP class have a well deck at the stern, allowing vessels to dock directly within the ship. By taking on water, the ship is able to lower its stern, flooding the well deck. This docking station gives the US Marine Corps Marine Expeditionary Unit unprecedented amphibious capabilities. In addition to supporting amphibious vehicles, the WASP class can hold up to 30 helicopters in its vast hangars, with nine helicopter landing spots available. 
it is also the first ship ever designed to operate the Harrier 2 aircraft, capable of vertical or short takeoff and landing. With air, land and sea coordination imperative to the success of an amphibious assault, the WASP class is equipped with the technology to provide unprecedented over-the-horizon assault capability. Unmatched in might and power, the WASP class is the key to triumph on land. For centuries, ruling the world required naval supremacy. The ongoing battle for domination of the seas has been one of immeasurable devastation and technological innovation. Wooden hulls were encased in iron as heavily armed battleships built and destroyed empires, only to fall victim to new enemies lurking beneath the waves. As floating cities launched attacks on land, sea and sky, ships' cannons were replaced with missiles, providing striking power across continents. World maps have been redrawn and countless lives lost in the unending quest to rule the waves. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the key to ruling the waves was firepower. Capital ships boasted the most devastating weaponry, and none were more formidable than the battleship. Dominating the ocean, battleships became a symbol of naval supremacy. Throughout the last months of 1990, coalition forces assembled in the Persian Gulf, responding to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. When Iraq failed to withdraw, Operation Desert Storm launched. After air forces began their bombardment, 27 Tomahawk cruise missiles were launched at inland Iraqi targets. These strikes would come from battleships built half a century earlier the Iowa class. Work began on the Iowa class before the outbreak of the Second World War, their construction taking five years. Capable of 60 kilometers per hour, they were the world's fastest battleships, but they did not sacrifice firepower for speed. Their 16-inch guns were the most powerful ever mounted on a US warship, with armor-piercing shells able to penetrate almost 10 meters of reinforced concrete. The Iowa class had the greatest anti-aircraft firepower of any ship in World War II, wielding 130 anti-aircraft guns and cannons. While operating in the Pacific theater, they protected Allied aircraft carriers against waves of Japanese planes. As America Island hopped their way toward Japan, the battleships provided artillery support for attacking amphibious troops. Despite their destructive power, the Iowa-class battleship's final mission in World War II would be one of peace. Led by the Iowa, the Missouri and Duke of York, the Great Fleet steamed their victory course to Tokyo Bay itself. On September the 2nd, 1945, Representatives from Japan and allied nations met on the decks of the USS Missouri to sign the Japanese Instrument of Surrender. The Iowa-class battleships would continue to serve in a variety of roles during the Korean and Vietnam conflicts. In the 1980s, they were pulled from retirement due to rising Cold War tension and as trouble brewed in the Persian Gulf, they were deployed once again. After a 70-year career, these mighty battleships have earned their retirement. Now museums, they stand as monuments to the role of the battleship in war and peace. September 3rd, 1939. 
After declaring war on Germany, the British Royal Navy embarked on a campaign to starve the Nazi war effort. The Kriegsmarine quickly retaliated, launching their own counter blockade. For more than five years, the Atlantic Ocean was engulfed in war. German U-boats and warships mercilessly hunted Allied merchants and naval defences. With Britain's fate to be decided upon the waves, Germany unveiled its most powerful ships of the war, the Bismarck class. Commissioned in 1940, the lead ship was named after Otto von Bismarck, the man credited with Germany's unification. 35,000 tons of German steel is ready to be launched in the presence of the Führer himself. In view of the Bismarck's awesome power, the commander asked the ship be referred to as he instead of the traditional she. It was the largest battleship in Europe. Powerful and extremely well protected, he had eight 15-inch guns arranged in twin turrets and his armour made up 40% of his weight. As the Bismarck slipped into the North Atlantic on a mission to hunt enemy merchants, the HMS Hood was sent to intercept. Britain's symbol of naval supremacy, the Hood was considered the only ship in the world powerful enough to take on the Bismarck. The Bismarck will do 30 knots, so becoming one of the fastest capital ships afloat. Only HMS Hood among British battleships is equally fast. A battlecruiser, the Hood carried less armour than the Bismarck, favouring speed and agility. At the Battle of Denmark Strait, the two giants of the sea closed in on one another. The Hood opened fire, along with Royal Navy battleship Prince of Wales. The Bismarck returned fire, striking the Hood's aft ammunition magazines. The Hood immediately exploded. Of the 1,419 crew, only three survived. The Hood's armour had been sacrificed for speed, and she was no match for the might of the premier Nazi battleship. In the dockyards of Portsmouth, 1912, construction began on a new breed of capital ship, faster, stronger and more advanced than anything before. Named for one of the most revered British monarchs of all time, they would lead the Royal Navy to victory in both wars, the Queen Elizabeth-class battleships. The Queen Elizabeth-class Super Dreadnoughts were the first capital ships to be fueled by oil rather than coal. Their four steam turbine engines propelling them to an unprecedented 44 kilometers per hour. The five ships were the most powerful British warships of the Great War, armed with eight 15-inch naval guns. The most successful heavy guns ever deployed by the Royal Navy their shells weighed almost 880 kilograms. During the 1930s, the Queen Elizabeth class were upgraded with anti-aircraft weapons, arming them for another war that would come all too soon. Old battleship into new. HMS Warspite is ready at last to sail the seas again after extensive reconstruction. The work of modernizing her has been in progress since 1934 at a cost of some two and a half million pounds. In 1940, during the Battle of Calabria, the Queen Elizabeth class HMS Warspite would make history. While defending Allied cruisers under fire from Italian warships, she made one of the longest range hits from a moving ship in history. With her guns at maximum elevation, Warspite managed to strike an Italian battleship from 24 kilometers. Warspite became the most honoured vessel of the Second World War and the most decorated ship in the history of the Royal Navy. By the 1960s, the age of the battleship had come to a close. Missiles superseded the range and destructive power of the naval gun and new classes of ships brandishing this immense power began to emerge. Built in the late 1980s, they are amongst the US Navy's fiercest weapons. 
the Ali Burke guided missile destroyer. These multi-mission destroyers can be stocked with up to 90 missiles, including subsonic Tomahawks, long-range cruise missiles that can obliterate targets up to 2,500 kilometers away. The heavy armor of the battleship has been replaced with other defensive innovations. Four Aegis radar flat panels form a virtual protective shield around the Ali Burke, providing 360-degree coverage and allowing it to track and guide weapons to destroy threats to the fleet. Built for modern warfare, they are the first large US Navy ships to feature stealth designs, such as angled surfaces, reducing their radar cross-section and making them harder to detect by enemy missiles. With sophisticated detection systems and deadly armament, the Ali Burke class of guided missile destroyers will dominate the seas for decades to come. Despite a warship's speed or power, there is nothing more fearsome than a threat from below the waves. Primitive at first, each generation of submersible warship has outclassed the one before. With armament and fuel driving innovation, the submarine has come to define power at sea. Lurking beneath the sea, undetectable to enemy forces, these silent predators can remain submerged for three months at a time, diving 300 meters below the surface. Patrolling the world's oceans since 1976, they are the backbone of the US Navy's submarine force, the Los Angeles-class submarine. Driven by a nuclear reactor providing 35,000 horsepower, the Los Angeles-class's top speed is highly classified. Bolstered by a growing fleet of modern Virginia-class fast-attack submersibles, these killing machines are designed to seek and destroy enemies above and below the waterline. Each carries a stock of Tomahawk missiles that can be fired from anywhere in the world's oceans. These covert predators have the potential to wield more explosive power than the oceans have ever seen. While modern submarines operate in secrecy, drawing little attention to their awesome capabilities, their predecessors were once the most feared killing machines in the world. In 1917, whilst battle ground to a deadlock on the Western Front, a new predator was prowling the Mediterranean. Declaring unrestricted warfare at sea, the German Empire had unleashed the Unterseeboot. The most deadly of the 274-strong fleet was U-35. U-35's longest serving captain, Lothar von Honor de la Perriere, was the most successful submarine ace in history. Sinking 195 ships, his record has never been beaten. This was one of his victims, a British freighter which he finished off with several rounds from his 22-pounder gun. Von de la Perriere was renowned for his scrupulous adherence to prize law. He preferred to attack ships from the surface employing his torpedoes as a last resort. Allowing enemy crews to board lifeboats, he provided directions to the nearest port before sending their ships to the ocean floor. Not all U-boat captains were as ethical, resulting in tragic civilian casualties. As the war progressed, Allied forces began developing countermeasures that would continue to be refined in the Second World War. Sky patrols kept constant lookout for surfaced vessels, revealing their positions to armed aircraft. Allied merchants began operating in armed convoys, with lead vessels deploying smoke screens to obscure the rest of the fleet. The diesel and electric motors that powered the submarines were loud and underwater microphones were developed to detect U-boats in hiding. Upon discovering an enemy, the Allies unleashed another new weapon, the depth charge. The explosion created hydraulic shocks 
that either sunk U-boats or forced them to surface where they would be at the mercy of Allied ships or aircraft. By early 1918, the Allies had suppressed the U-boat threat, but the campaign lost 5,000 ships and countless men to the ocean. Surviving through it all, the indestructible U-35. With stealth and surprise, key tools in the submarine's arsenal, the need to resurface for air and fuel was an Achilles heel. The diesel and electric engines of early submarines only allowed for limited dive time, but an explosive energy source would usher in a new age of underwater weaponry in the form of a revolutionary machine, the USS Nautilus. Although nuclear technology was feared around the world, there were those that saw it as the fuel of the future. The challenge facing the US Navy was developing a reactor small enough to fit into the hull of the vessel and safe enough to protect crew from nuclear contamination. Built over the course of 18 months by the electric boat company, the USS Nautilus launched in 1954. An undersea giant built to circle the globe without refueling, the SS Nautilus launches a new era in the history of subsurface vessels. Carrying a fuel supply that would last two years and allow the Nautilus to travel over 100,000 kilometers, she ventured to depths and locations beyond the limits of previous submarines. The massive amount of heat rendered by the uranium in the reactor was used to generate steam, powering the craft's turbines and accelerating the Nautilus to unprecedented speeds. Remaining submerged for as long as she had food for her crew, the anti-submarine tactics of both world wars were rendered obsolete. On the 3rd of August, 1958, the Nautilus completed Operation Sunshine, a submerged transit of the North Pole. But all went without a hitch. Nautilus passed safely on her route right under the pole. A tremendous achievement and a moment of relief, I should think, for all on board when she surfaced. The historic journey was more than just a publicity stunt. It proved the viability of nuclear power at sea, laying the foundation for the next stage of the submarine's evolution. Since gaining power in 1933, Adolf Hitler had secretly begun constructing a new fleet of U-boats. When Britain declared war on Germany in 1939, he had already amassed 46 submarines, the most common among them, the Type 7. Within the first eight hours of the war, the U-boats claimed their first target, sinking the passenger ship SS Athenia, killing 128 civilian passengers and crew. The biggest war news of these early days has been the criminal sinking of the Athenia. These survivors are victims of Hitler's first crime by submarine. Once again, U-boats had a stranglehold on Allied shipping lines. Wolf packs of up to 20 U-boats would ambush merchant convoys, sinking 2,779 ships in five years. Winston Churchill wrote, the only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. Undoubtedly, one of the most formidable assets of the Axis powers in the present phase of the war is the U-boat. The submarines are wearing pennants that boast of Allied shipping sent to the bottom. Armed with as many as 22 torpedoes, U-boats were able to strike multiple times before returning to base to rearm. Guided by a gyroscope and propelled by steam, the torpedoes could rise or dive through the water to pre-calculated depths. Initially, explosives were triggered upon contact with an enemy ship, while later in the war, magnetic ignition was introduced, detonating under the influence of a vessel's hull. With their attacks against the Allies taking them a long way from home, 
the Nazis commissioned a fleet of refueling submersibles that the Allies dubbed milk cows. Carrying fuel tanks rather than firepower, the 10 milk cows could hold up to 600 tonnes of diesel fuel. To refuel, both the milk cow and the U-boat needed to surface. Dangerously exposed, the process lasted five hours. The Allies knew that sinking the milk cows would end U-boat operations in the Atlantic and began mercilessly targeting them. As the war came to an end, all 10 of the milk cows would be lying at the bottom of the ocean, along with two-thirds of the U-boat fleet. Four out of every five German submariners would meet their demise, earning the U-boat its final moniker, the Iron Coffin. Throughout the Cold War, the fear of nuclear annihilation gripped both sides of the Iron Curtain. To ensure their ability to retaliate in the event of a Soviet nuclear strike, the US Navy designed a range of submarines capable of launching a counterattack from anywhere on Earth. The George Washington class submarine. Launched in 1959, the USS George Washington was the first of 41 ballistic missile submarines designed as a deterrent against the Soviet nuclear threat. So powerful was the George Washington's armament, President Kennedy would describe it as one of the most important systems ever created. Packed with 16 Polaris missiles, each 40 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, they could strike a Soviet target 2,000 kilometers away. Concealed and always on the move, submarines were the ideal method of delivering long-range strikes. However, with rocket engines needing air to burn, launching a missile required a submarine to surface. Its position uncovered, a submarine would once again be vulnerable to attack. But the George Washington class had a secret weapon, a revolutionary new deployment system that would allow the Polaris to launch from the ocean depths. The Polaris could be fitted with an H-bomb warhead and it's reported that one submarine's batteries could fire the equivalent of all the high explosive detonated in World War II. As the waterproof seal on the launch tube exploded, compressed air would project the missile through 40 metres of water at over 80 kilometres per hour. Breaking the surface, the rockets would ignite once they came into contact with the air. On July 20th, 1960, the USS George Washington made history, successfully launching the first Polaris missile while submerged. The first missile, after a startling off-angle emergence, corrects itself and soars downrange 1,100 miles to its target with remarkable accuracy. The George Washington completed 55 patrols, her warheads trained on targets across the vast Soviet Union. Of the five ships in her class, she was the last to retire after 25 years as a lethal deterrent of the deep. In the first half of the 20th century, the changing face of naval warfare highlighted the vulnerability of the lumbering battleship. A new breed of hybrid ships would emerge, sacrificing armour to gain speed whilst maintaining the heavy-hitting firepower of the battleship, the battlecruisers. After World War I, with the Treaty of Versailles limiting the weight of German warships, the Reich Marine created a new class of cruisers that appeared to conform to the restrictions. Lighter than the traditional battleship, yet more heavily armed than any cruiser that had come before, the Deutschland class. Built during the interwar period, each Deutschland-class cruiser officially displaced no more than 10,000 tonnes on paper. Yet fully stocked and crewed, the cruisers violated the treaty. Armed with six 11-inch guns, their enormous firepower in relation to their small size earned them the British nickname Pocket Battleship. As the Second World War commenced, Nazi Germany unleashed their pocket battleships into the Atlantic, where their combined speed and firepower made them formidable hunters. 
In 1939, the Admiral Graf Spey, the third of the Deutschland-class cruisers, had been successfully raiding merchant ships in the South Atlantic when she was spotted by a group of three British cruisers. The Royal Navy pounced, but the Admiral Graf Spey managed to fight off all three attackers within the hour. Damaged, she limped to Montevideo to evacuate the wounded and receive repairs. The British Admiralty seized upon the opportunity, deliberately laying down false communications for the Admiral Graf Spey to intercept. The Graf Spey's captain was fooled into believing that a large British naval force was en route to attack the crippled cruiser. Instead of surrendering his ship to the enemy, Captain Hans Langsdorff scuttled the Admiral Graf Spey on December the 18th 1939. Throughout the Cold War, air-based attacks emerged as the greatest threat to warships. Anti-aircraft capabilities became essential to fleet survival. Second only to the aircraft carrier in strength and size, cruisers became the bodyguards of the ocean, protecting fleets against threats from the air. An integral member of an aircraft carrier battle group, the Ticonderoga class of guided missile cruisers can eliminate incoming enemy threats and make deadly offensive strikes on land, sea and air targets. Enemy aircraft and projectiles are all tracked by the Ticonderoga's Aegis phased array radar, which can guide 122 missiles to intercept threats. Whilst the Aegis combat system is undoubtedly effective, its technological complexity has led to some tragic disasters. In 1988, Ticonderoga cruiser USS Vincennes strayed into Iranian waters whilst engaging hostile gunboats. In the ensuing confusion, the Vincennes fired on what the captain believed to be an incoming enemy fighter. It was later revealed that no fighter was on course toward the ship, but a passenger flight with 290 people on board. All on the flight perished. Some sources lay blame on an over-eager captain, whilst others on the complex Aegis combat system, which interpreted the flight's transponder code as military rather than civilian. The Ticonderoga class has taken on board the innovations of past battlecruisers. With a top speed of 60 kilometers per hour and Kevlar protecting vital areas, it's not weighed down by its armor. Their electronic warfare systems and extensive combat history give these modern cruisers the technology and experience to serve well into the 21st century. Where battleships were once the most feared weapons on the ocean, the late 19th century saw a dramatic shift in naval warfare as smaller, swifter threats emerged. From humble beginnings as torpedo boat killers, the destroyer has evolved into one of the most dependable and formidable weapons in a Navy's arsenal. In World War II, as the Battle of the Atlantic raged, Allied convoys became increasingly susceptible to German submarines. In 1942 alone, the Allies lost 1,664 supply ships. Nazi wolf packs marauding the sea lanes sank desperately needed supplies, threatening not only Britain's ability to fight, but the nation's very existence. Desperate to protect the fleet against the submersible torpedo boats, the Royal Navy began retooling large numbers of World War I and interwar era destroyers. Initially ill-equipped to battle the German U-boats and Luftwaffe, the British destroyers played catch up with German technology. They were quickly updated with larger anti-aircraft guns, torpedo tubes and mine laying capabilities. Down below, some hundreds of mines wait to be launched from Clapham Junction, the naval nickname for this deck. 
the British Navy laid over 20,000 mines, sinking over 1,050 Axis surface vessels and submarines. As the war progressed, the Royal Navy implemented the War Emergency Program, building flotillas of new utility destroyers. The new designs transformed the destroyer from defensive protector to U-boat hunter killer. Sonar and radar enable destroyers to detect and respond to inbound attacks with mortars added to the anti-sub arsenal. The destroyers helped the Allies to suppress the U-boat threat in the Atlantic, and their increased strength saw them become formidable weapon systems by war's end. In 1942, 51 Allied destroyers were lost to enemy attacks, but within three short years, that number would fall to just two. In the late 19th century, a British engineer created an explosive new weapon that could cripple or sink a main battleship. The advent of the torpedo revolutionised naval warfare. The large, ironclad battleships of the era were now vulnerable to smaller, swift torpedo boats fitted with multiple launches for the self-propelled Whitehead torpedo. Powered by a compressed air engine and driven by a propeller, the Whitehead torpedo could travel over 700 metres at nearly 30 kilometres per hour. Built in their hundreds and powered by new combustion engines, attack torpedo boats were faster and more agile than their enormous battleship prey. To counteract this threat, a new class of warship was needed to shield the fleet. Maneuverable, long-enduring and capable of repelling the short-range attackers. The destroyer was born. By the outbreak of World War I, the torpedo had been adopted by the submarine. Battleships and merchant convoys now had an enemy that could strike from beneath the ocean surface. To counter the submersible menace, a new breed of destroyer would begin to emerge during the final years of World War I, the American Four Stacks. A nickname allotted to a handful of classes sporting four iconic smokestacks, the American destroyers were powered by steam turbine engines. The Four Stacks could travel at twice the speed of a U-boat laying covering smoke screens to obscure the larger and slower ships in their fleet from the submarine's periscope. When confronted with German U-boats, they could chase them down and attack with their deck guns or unleash depth charges and torpedoes. Conceived to protect against fast threats above the water, the destroyer had evolved to thwart threats from the deep. The success of the initial four stacks saw large numbers built after war's end, many serving in World War II. In 1964, in the waters of the Gulf of Tonkin, the destroyer would once again be pitted against the torpedo boat. The ensuing confrontation would launch the United States into a bloody war. With tensions between the US and North Vietnam at boiling point, US naval destroyers conducted intelligence gathering operations just outside the borders of Vietnamese territorial waters. On August 2nd, an Allen M. Sumner class destroyer, the USS Maddox, radioed that she was under attack by three North Vietnamese torpedo boats. Nearby aircraft carrier, USS Ticonderoga, launched four fighters to aid the Maddox while she pummeled the Vietnamese boats with over 280 shells. Undeterred by the attack, the Maddox, reinforced by another destroyer, maintained patrols to test the resolve of the North Vietnamese. Two days later, both ships claimed another attack. Within half an hour of hearing of the second attack, US President Lyndon Johnson decided on retaliatory airstrikes, 
ramping up open warfare against North Vietnam. Warplanes from the Ticonderoga avenged the unwarranted red assault as a warning to the communists that unprovoked attacks will bring prompt response. The incident sparked US involvement in a war that lasted more than a decade and claimed the lives of over three million people. Despite leading the US into armed conflict, the destroyer's stories eventually unraveled with no evidence of the second skirmish occurring. Incorrect sonar and radar readings due to freak weather effects were blamed for the false reports and findings were kept from the public until declassified reports revealed the truth in 2005. The largest class of destroyers built by any nation during World War II in the thick of action during the Battle for the Pacific, they became heroes of the US Naval Fleet. The Fletcher class destroyers. With the US Navy's Pacific Fleet lying in ruins after the Pearl Harbor attacks, the war effort went into full swing, producing 175 Fletcher class destroyers between 1942 and 1944. With the Japanese airstrikes firmly in minds of the designers and engineers, the Fletcher class were the first destroyers built with air and surface radar to warn of incoming attacks. Once thought of solely as defense for capital ships, Fletcher class destroyers were ideal at covering the vast distances required to battle in the Pacific theater. Whenever the call for a fast ship went out, the Fletcher class were thrown into close combat. Their five single five-inch guns could blast down enemy aircraft with 24 kilogram projectiles or cover troops during beach invasions. In October 1944, during the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese Imperial Navy made a desperate attempt to wipe out the United States Pacific Fleet and defeat an American invasion of the Philippines. 280 warships, half of which were destroyers and their escorts, took part in the largest naval battle in history. As the Japanese unleashed kamikaze bombers for the first time, the Fletchers formed protective barriers around battleships and aircraft carriers. As their crews fought through a hail of bullets, bombs and suicide aircraft. The battle was a decisive defeat for the Japanese. The Empire had gambled almost their entire navy and lost. The destruction ended their ability to conduct large-scale naval operations for the rest of the war. In August 1945, Fleet Admiral William Halsey selected three of the most decorated Fletcher-class destroyers, the Taylor, Nicholas and O'Bannon, to escort the USS Missouri into Tokyo Bay for the Japanese surrender, honoring the role these indefatigable warships played in the Pacific Allied victory. As soon as man could fly, air machines played a role in warfare at sea. With destructive capability defined by the number of aircraft per deck rather than the power of the guns, the role of the capital ship fell to the carrier. Operated by the United States Navy, this mighty warship was one of the most powerful killing machines devised. A floating airbase that could launch air attack and defense missions from any ocean across the globe. The only ship in her class and the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise. At 342 meters long, the Enterprise is the longest naval vessel ever built, with more steel going into her construction than the Empire State Building. With eight reactors providing 280,000 horsepower, she was the largest nuclear power facility in the world when she entered service in 1962. Where diesel-powered aircraft carriers had to be refueled approximately every three days, the Big E could sail for three years. 
Launching aircraft during the Vietnam War, the Enterprise became the first nuclear-powered ship to engage in combat, setting a record of 165 strike sorties in a single day. After more than half a century of service, she retired in 2013. The longest serving aircraft carrier in history, the Enterprise and her crew have lived up to their motto, we are legend. Since the inception of flight, aircraft were pivotal tools in naval combat. But with fuel reserves limiting the reach of planes, warships were needed to carry them into conflict zones. In August 1917, a Royal Navy pilot was the first to land his aircraft on the deck of a moving ship. Although he died in a later attempt, his daring stunt proved the viability of a floating airbase. Across the Atlantic, US military mines were busy converting a cargo ship into a carrier, mounting a flight deck on top of her superstructure. The USS Langley's deck was still too short for pilots to achieve takeoff speeds. And so, a gunpowder-powered catapult was developed to launch aircraft. The Langley also pioneered a resting gear. When coming into land, a hook on the plane's tail was used to snare cables strung across the ship's deck. With sandbags either side, aircraft were slowed before reaching the end of the deck. In 1925, the US Navy implemented the pioneering technology in their first true aircraft carriers, the Lexington and Saratoga. Both ships served into the Second World War and Lexington would be sunk in the first carrier battle in history. The Saratoga would survive the conflict, but her end would come from the same power as Enterprise's reactors. During the first nuclear tests since the bombing of Nagasaki, she was sunk to the depths of the Bikini Atoll. The Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor pulled the US Navy into the global conflict. As the ocean between America and Japan was transformed into a battleground, the aircraft carrier would provide the platform for US retaliation. In a plan conceived by Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, the USS Hornet was tasked with launching the first air raid on the Japanese home islands. The lethal sting in the Hornet's tail was the 16 B-25 bombers loaded onto her flight deck. To make the B-25s light enough to take off from the carrier's short runway, they had been stripped of all their weapons. Carrying five crew and four bombs each, fuel stores were minimised to further reduce weight. Jimmy Doolittle and his airmen, fearing the troll boats might have sent a radio warning to Japan, decided to start on their exploit sooner than they'd planned. With a furious gale churning the sea, the raid was launched 300 kilometres prematurely. The Hornet turned into the heavy winds, providing the bombers with as much lift as possible, while flight controllers waited until the waves raised the ship's deck. The B-25s reached their strategic targets, but the increased range and reduced fuel meant that all crew were forced to either bail out or crash land their aircraft. After the Doolittle raid, the Hornet continued to launch strikes in the Pacific. On October 1942, the Hornet came under heavy attack by Japanese forces. Overwhelmed by aerial bombardment, she sank off the Santa Cruz Islands. The American aircraft carrier Hornet, commissioned only seven weeks before Pearl Harbor, played during her short life a most powerful and gallant part in the Pacific struggle. USS Hornet was in service for a year and six days when she became the last major US aircraft carrier sunk by enemy fire. The birth of the jet age would bring about new opportunities and challenges for the aircraft carrier. 
Faster, heavier and more powerful than propeller craft, the jet would require a ship to match. Launched in December 1954, the Forrestal class was the first to fully support jet aircraft. Angling the ship's flight deck was a simple design concept, but one that provided enormous benefits. Achieving a longer runway, it also allowed for concurrent launch and recovery operations. The landing area is specially angled to help homing pilots. For takeoff, steam catapults are used, highly efficient and, by the way, a British invention. With more pilots lost to crash landings than enemy fire, the angled flight deck removed the need for a crash barrier at the end of the runway. Aircraft that missed the arresto wires could safely abort the landing and fly around for a second attempt. Employing an arrangement of mirrors and lights, the Forrestal class utilised an optical landing system to guide a pilot's angle of descent, even with the ship pitching in the roughest seas. A torch would be shone into a gyroscopically controlled concave mirror, producing a ball of light. For the pilot coming into land, this ball would move up and down the mirror in relation to their current glide path. When achieving a correct landing trajectory, the ball would line up with a strip of lights either side of the mirror. The pinnacle of naval technology at the dawn of the jet age, the USS Forrestal was retired after 37 years, superseded by nuclear-powered behemoths. During some of the fiercest fighting of World War II, a new legend of the ocean would emerge. She was a U-boat hunter, battleship destroyer, and a prize example of British ingenuity. The HMS Ark Royal. Eight hundred feet long, the Ark Royal is the most up-to-date carrier in the world. She's the first of the new floating aerodromes for the fleet air arm. Launched in 1937, the Ark Royal was the world's first true aircraft carrier and the blueprint for those to come. Ships had previously placed their island superstructure containing the command centre and air traffic control in the middle of the ship for stability, limiting the length of the flight deck. An ingenious design, the Ark Royal's island was offset to her starboard side, while an extended hull kept her balanced. This allowed the Ark Royal a 240 metre long flight deck for her fleet of 60 fighters and bombers. The Ark Royal would go on to become a national hero during one of the greatest sea battles of World War II. The pride of the German fleet, the Bismarck, had sunk HMS Hood during the Battle of Denmark Strait and the Ark Royal crew were determined to avenge their fallen comrades. Locating the German battleship, the Ark Royal launched 15 ferry swordfish bombers to attack. A torpedo from a swordfish struck the port side of the Bismarck, rendering her inoperable. Unable to escape the approaching destroyers, the Bismarck was sunk 14 hours later. Of her 2,200 crew, only 114 survived the attack. The unsinkable Nazi battleship Bismarck, sunk by the torpedoes and guns of our fleet, is not only revenge for the loss of the hood, but it's a resounding victory in itself. One of the largest and most sophisticated warships ever built, she owes her success to a century of innovation, the USS Nimitz. The leading ship in her class, with nine additional supercarriers serving as home base to a host of lethal weapon systems. A floating city of over 5,500 people, her dual nuclear reactors could keep her at sea for a quarter of a century. The Nimitz's air wing includes an array of 90 helicopters and combat jets, more powerful than the air force of most nations. The supercarrier features a 4.5 acre flight deck described as the most dangerous workplace on Earth. She can launch a fighter every 20 seconds, rocketing them into the air via four steam catapults. To protect against enemy attacks, 
The Nimitz is encased with top secret armor, while her tactical team can deploy an array of missiles and two phalanx close-in weapon systems that can destroy anything that penetrates her defenses. The embodiment of power at sea, a century's worth of development and innovation have culminated in the ultimate killing machine. The dream of flight, quickly consumed by the machine of war. Wood and canvas gave way to steel, and a pistol wielded by a single pilot became a missile flying at supersonic speeds. The battlefield of the clouds would climb beyond the stratosphere, and the power wielded by a flying fortress would one day be in the hands of a single pilot. Faster, stronger, and more brutal. Each innovation, the result of a never-ending quest for supremacy, a quest to conquer the sky. speed. With their superiority, the aim of military forces worldwide, aircraft became faster, more sophisticated and increasingly lethal. As air-to-air -air combat raged in the skies, the ace and the fighter jet were immortalized as legends. During the Cold War, the United States military required a new fighter capable of defeating the fearsome Soviet MiG jets. To dominate the air, they needed to produce an aircraft with exceptional speed, maneuverability, and climb rate that could outperform their Russian counterparts. This arms race would create one of the most lethal weapons in the sky. The McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle, the first air superiority fighter designed for the US Air Force. With a range of variants, it is engineered to engage enemy aircraft traveling two and a half times the speed of sound. Its twin engines producing enough thrust to smash through the sound barrier in a vertical climb. The F-15 first went into service with the Israeli Air Force in 1978, but it would be another three years until its long-awaited showdown with the MiG. On the 13th of February, 1981, while patrolling the northern border of Israel, Moshe Melnik, an Israeli Air Force ace, recorded the F-15's first kill, shooting down a Syrian MiG-25. The F-15 has since claimed over 100 victories, yet to this day, it has never been shot down in air-to-air -air combat, a record exceeding any other aircraft. On December 17, 1903, in a field south of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the first controlled and sustained heavier-than-air flight took place. Although Wilbur and Orville Wright were not the first to build and fly an experimental aircraft, they were the first to invent the three-axis control mechanism, a device enabling pilots to steer and maintain an aircraft's equilibrium, an innovation still used today. A little more than a decade later, the First World War broke out in Europe. Aeronautic technology was still in its infancy and planes constructed from wood wrapped in canvas would become tools of war. Initially flying reconnaissance missions, pilots soon began dropping bombs onto ground targets. When encountering an enemy aircraft, pilots began firing upon each other with handheld pistols. However, flying a plane and operating a handheld weapon was far from ideal. Engineers began designing methods to mount weapons to aircraft. The first true solution arrived in the form of the synchronization gear. A simple device that disabled firing when the blades were aligned with the gun barrel. As the blades rotated into a safe position, the gear was tripped, allowing the bullets to pass harmlessly through the arc between the propellers. The airplane had become a weaponized killing machine. 
aerial combat became known as dogfighting, and pilots victorious in five duels achieved the status of ace. The life of an ace was all too often short-lived. During World War I, the average life expectancy of an RAF pilot was a mere 93 hours. But the devastation inflicted during those hours could change the outcome of war. Only 16 years since the plane's debut at Kitty Hawk, the Great War came to a close. However, by this time, the Royal Air Force had amassed 4,000 combat aircraft, and the fighter was here to stay. In 1940, Hitler prepared to invade Britain by unleashing the world's most lethal air force on the island nation. The Luftwaffe relentlessly bombed air defences and terrorised civilians. London burned while air raid sirens directed people to take cover. Britain needed an airborne hero to defeat the German planes and quell the Nazi invasion. The Supermarine Spitfire. Launched in 1938, the Spitfire was an interceptor aircraft designed to thwart enemy bombing missions. Powered by a 1,030 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine, it flew at a top speed of 580 kilometers per hour, faster than the German Messerschmitt fighters. At altitudes above 4,600 meters, it could outmaneuver its enemy, providing the edge in a dogfight. The only Allied plane built throughout the entirety of World War II, the Spitfire was British ingenuity at its best, carrying the hopes and prayers of a nation on its iconic elliptical wings. Alongside the Spitfire in the uncertain skies was the Hawker Hurricane. At 530 kilometers per hour, it was slower than the Spitfire and it had a lower climb rate, but together, the two fighters made a formidable team. While the public takes shelter, our fighter pilots take off to destroy the enemy. The Royal Air Force was heavily outnumbered by the Luftwaffe with a force twice the size. Winning the Battle of Britain would take more than superior planes and pilots. It would require strategy and revolutionary technology. Using radio waves reflected off the target and back to the source, Radar forewarned the British Air Force of the size, speed and scale of an inbound Luftwaffe attack. Headquarters was then able to give the command for squadrons to scramble, providing a head start on the incoming assault. As the battle waged, the Spitfires targeted the Messerschmitts. The Hurricanes then slipped through the now open defences and ripped the Nazi bombers to pieces. The first Hurricanes carrying eight machine guns in their wings literally soared through the fuselages of enemy raiders. The Battle of Britain resulted in a decisive win for the Allies, with air superiority the key to victory. It was Germany's first major defeat of the war, with Hitler giving the order to retreat from Britain and abandoning all plans of an invasion. Winston Churchill said of the battle, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Escalating their war against the South in 1950, the bulk of North Korea's Air Force consisted of inexperienced pilots and World War II era planes. To compete against American technology, North Korea turned to her communist allies. Working in secrecy, the Soviets had designed a new fighter using turbojet technology. The MiG-15 had arrived. Incredibly, the British government had granted the Soviets permission to copy their Rolls-Royce Neen engine, providing the new fighter the power to reach speeds of 1,033 kilometers per hour. The MiG-15 possessed revolutionary swept wings. Angled backwards, the wings reduced aerodynamic drag, allowing superior stability and performance. A new challenger was needed, and it came when the US unveiled its own swept-wing jet, the F-86 Sabre. With a top speed of 1,091 kilometers per hour, the Sabre leveled the playing field. 
the Korean War would provide the location for the first jet battles. The border between North and South became known as MIG Alley as dogfights against sabers raged. American saber jets sweep into battle to engage Russian-built MIG 15s, and US Air Force camera gun pictures show us the destruction of one of the enemies. The Sabre's larger wingspan provided exceptional maneuverability, and the US's veteran pilots were superior to the enemy. With both jets almost a mirror of one another, these two factors saw the Sabre triumph with a kill ratio of almost 10 to 1. On December 7, 1941, without warning, 353 Japanese fighters attacked the United States naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. For over seven hours, the raiders pummeled the US Navy with unyielding ferocity. The attack dragged the United States into the Second World War, and for the next three and a half years, the Allies would battle the Japanese Empire in the bloody Pacific theater. Triggering the Pacific War, the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M-0 had been in service with the Imperial Navy for a little over a year. Launched from an aircraft carrier, they were the longest range single engine fighter of the war, known for their exceptional maneuverability, especially at low speeds. Initially pitted against the US Grumman F4F Wildcat, the Zero was clearly a superior fighter. The Wildcats were slower, less maneuverable and underarmed, often running out of ammunition before they could strike their target. The United States desperately needed a fighter that could defeat the Zeros. Still recovering from Pearl Harbor, the US Navy accelerated development of a new military machine. Moving from prototype to operational in less than a year, a new fighter took to the skies, the Grumman F6F Hellcat. Far superior to their predecessor, the Hellcat's engine was more than twice as powerful. They were just as agile as their zero adversaries, but could clock speeds 100 kilometers faster. The Hellcats were armored against enemy fire, and their fuel tanks were constructed of multiple layers of rubber and fabric that would swell and expand when mixed with leaking fuel, sealing any breach. Fragile and lightweight, the Zeros lacked this technology and would often burst into flames as they plunged into the ocean. Throughout the war, the Hellcats built a 13 to 1 kill ratio against the Zeros, destroying more than 5,000 enemy fighters. They were responsible for 75% of all US Navy aerial victories. The continual loss of experienced Japanese pilots and their planes saw the Hellcats achieve their superiority. By 1945, the final year of the Pacific War, the Zeros had already become outdated, and a new desperate weapon emerged. That Japanese plane has been hit and it's going to crash. Either by chance or in a suicidal effort to strike a final blow, plane and pilot crash into an American landing craft full of troops. Some 3,860 Japanese pilots plummeted to their death during the suicide attacks, taking ships and servicemen with them. Less than a decade after the first flight, pilots began unleashing bombs from the sky. Within just 35 years, the Super Fortress would cast a shadow over Hiroshima, and the bomber would become the most deadly killing machine the world had ever known. But the story of the bomber is more than just destruction, a tale of technological ingenuity enabling flight that is faster, higher, and more silent than ever before. A hallmark aviation innovation, this jet-powered strategic bomber currently holds 61 records for speed, payload and distance. The Rockwell B-1 Lancer. The backbone of the US long-range bomber force, the Lancer flies at high altitudes achieving supersonic speeds. Beginning life at the end of the Cold War, the B-1 was designed to carry a payload of nuclear weapons. 
The original prototypes were constructed with an escape capsule protecting the full crew against the extreme conditions of the jet's operational altitudes. The design feature was abandoned when a B-1 crew member died after a low altitude ejection. The B-1's original nuclear capabilities were dismantled in favour of conventional munitions. It now carries over 56 tonnes of armament, the largest payload of both guided and unguided weapons in the Air Force's infantry. A proven killing machine, the Rockwell B-1 will be standing up to enemy combatants well into the future. The Nazi bombing raids over the skies of Britain aimed to force the country into a peace treaty, but the plan backfired. The Royal Air Force won the battle for Britain, and the seeds of revenge were quickly sown. In 1942, the British Air Force retaliated by unleashing the Avro Lancaster long-range heavy bomber. The Lancaster's massive bays were able to carry the largest bombs ever known in air warfare including the 10-tonne Grand Slam earthquake bomb. The Lancaster is the best in the world, and we believe it's a weapon with a great destiny in the winning of this war. With Germany well within the Lancaster's 2,000-kilometre combat radius, the Allies began pounding cities 24 hours a day. Air Marshal Harris has promised Germany a tremendous, unprecedented, non-stop bombing. One of the most inventive campaigns occurred in May 1943 when the British launched Operation Chastise. The targets were two German dams that when ruptured would cripple vital Nazi infrastructure. The challenge was to deliver an explosive past the defensive torpedo nets to each dam's vulnerable base. The solution required a low altitude approach before the Lancaster would launch their bouncing bombs. The charges, backspinning at 500 revolutions per minute, would skip along the water, over the nets, and hug the dam walls as they sank to the base. The dams were spectacularly destroyed, and the flooding was catastrophic. Whilst a tremendous display of British ingenuity, the attack itself was strategically underwhelming. Within nearly a month, water output was restored and the electricity grid was producing full power. Worse still, the majority of lives lost in the attack were civilians and prisoners of war. Over the course of the conflict, Lancaster's dropped more than 608,000 tonnes of bombs. The most successful British bomber of World War II, the Lancaster was essential to Allied victory. But with almost half of all Lancasters and their crew failing to return home, the service of these brave men and this incredible aircraft will never be forgotten. Perhaps no technology is more synonymous with the development of bombers than the turbojet engine. Invented by Frank Whittle for the Royal Air Force in 1921, the turbojet engine enabled speeds and heights vital to the operations of New Age bombers. The jet engine works by ingesting air through a gas-powered turbine. The air is then compressed by a series of rotor blades before moving into a combustion chamber where it is heated by fuel. The turbine exhaust is then expanded in the propelling nozzle where it is accelerated to high speeds. The birth of the jet age combined with the arms race of the Cold War set military development on a fast track. As the Iron Curtain was drawn, Military forces around the world began equipping their aircraft with this new power. In 1951, the British Royal Air Force unveiled their first jet bomber, the English Electric Canberra. In the year of its introduction, the Canberra was the first jet to make a non-stop transatlantic flight, travelling from Northern Ireland to Newfoundland in Canada. In 1957, it set a world altitude record of 21,430 metres. New glory is shed on the British aircraft industry by the success of the record-breaking Canberra. Adaptable and advanced, the Canberra was used in a variety of roles, 
from that of a tactical nuclear strike aircraft through to a photo reconnaissance jet. Its popularity saw 1,352 of the cameras produced in a decade. As the Cold War continued, a school of thought arose, believing that if aircraft could travel high and fast enough, they could simply outfly enemy interceptors and ground-to-air missiles. Speed and altitude quickly became the focus of development, and in 1960, the US unveiled the first supersonic bomber, the Convair B-58 Hustler. A high-altitude strategic bomber, the B-58's delta-shaped wings enabled 19 world speed records. Its 1963 record of longest sustained supersonic flight remains unbroken to this day. However, despite its incredible performance, it had been built on a false premise. In the same year as the B-58's unveiling, a CIA reconnaissance aircraft operating at the same high altitudes intended for the Hustler was shot down by a Soviet missile. The Hustler's speed and top altitude were revealed to be within enemy range. The B-58 was repurposed for low penetration roles, but never saw active combat, retiring within a decade. Just as the Hustler was leaving service, the US unveiled a new trailblazing bomber the F-111 Aardvark. Able to alter the position of its wings with a swept configuration, the F-111 could perform at altitudes and speeds similar to the B-58. Wings in the full forward position, the Aardvark was optimized for lower speed maneuvers and could carry a greater payload. The F-111 also employed ground-hugging technology, enabling it to fly below enemy radar. As the Aardvark's own radar scanned the upcoming landscape, a flight path was mapped for the autopilot, allowing consistent altitude and speed. Using this technology, the F-111 could fly as low as 60 metres above the ground at supersonic speeds, delivering its payload into enemy territory without detection. Although the B-58 and the F-111 both flew their last missions decades ago, these first-generation supersonic bombers remain pioneers of technologies that live on in military aircraft today. During the 1960s, tensions between the US and the Soviets was at fever pitch. As part of Operation Chrome Dome, 12 nuclear-armed bombers constantly encircled the Soviet Union 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The Boeing B-52 Strato Fortress. Waiting on the go command from the US president, the B-52s were poised to retaliate if the Soviets launched a nuclear attack. For over seven years, a fully armed B-52 was never more than two hours away from Soviet targets. Operation Crumb Dome came to an end in 1968 when a B-52 flying over Greenland crashed into sea ice in the North Star Bay, causing radioactive contamination from the four hydrogen bombs on board. With intercontinental ballistic missiles replacing bombers as the primary means of nuclear weapons delivery, the B-52 was redesigned to carry non-atomic weapons. With plans to keep the bomber active until 2045, the B-52's service duration will stretch 90 years, unprecedented for any aircraft, military or civilian. The bombing campaigns undertaken by both the Axis and Allied forces during World War II have long been debated both on moral grounds and effectiveness. Rather than only attacking military targets, Operations focused on industry and infrastructure, aiming to cripple the enemy and terrorize populations. Civilians were all too often casualties of war. One heavy bomber designed for high altitude strategic missions would go on to become the single most destructive weapon in the world, the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. 
after the savage blows at Pearl Harbor, production of the B-29 was fast-tracked. 500 would be constructed before a single prototype had even been tested. Here the planes are assembled, planes embodying every advanced idea gained by Boeing in the last 10 years. When the B-29 entered service in 1944, they were exclusively assigned to strategic Japanese targets. With a top speed of 560 kilometers per hour, they were not exceptionally fast. However, the B-29 was able to fly well beyond the reach of Japanese fighters. The attacks gravely damaged Japan's ability to support its population and war efforts. In only one night of bombing alone, 25% of all the buildings in Tokyo were destroyed while one million people were left homeless. Still, Japan refused to raise the white flag. In August 1945, two modified B-29s delivered the knockout blows, decimating Hiroshima and Nagasaki with uranium bombs. That's the atomic bomb exploding at Nagasaki. The film was taken in a B-29 many miles away. All of you who see this picture can judge for yourselves the extent of the menace to civilization of this new weapon. With more than 129,000 perishing in the strikes, Japan surrendered within a month. Production of the B-29 halted after World War II. However, the Superfortress would continue to blaze a trail for aviation and bomber technology. In October 14, 1947, a modified B-29 was loaded with an experimental rocket plane, the Bell X-1. Piloted by Air Force Captain Charles Chuck Yeager, the X-1 was named Glamorous Glennis after his wife. Built in the shape of a bullet to remain stable at supersonic speeds, the X-1 reached Mark 1.06, making it the first manned aircraft to exceed the speed of sound. Engineers could now push aircraft even faster. The sound barrier now broken, the skies were no longer the limit. Dominating the skies, this flying ghost is able to break through seemingly impenetrable defences to hit the enemy before they even see it coming. The Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit. A strategic long-range heavy bomber with the most advanced anti-detection technology on the planet. Developed in the 1970s, Anti-reflective paint is used to reduce the Spirit's optical visibility when flying during daylight. The B-2 has no visible fuselage or tail. With no sharp angles to reflect radio waves, the bomber's radar detectability is so small the aircraft can only be spotted when its internal bomb bay is open. The four non-afterburning turbofan engines are buried deep within its wings, concealing sound and heat signatures. The absence of afterburners, and therefore hot exhaust, decreases the B-2's infrared footprint. With an array of conventional and nuclear weapons, the B-2 can carry 18 tons of sophisticated GPS-aided munitions. The B-2 is the only aircraft in the world capable of deploying the massive Ordnance Penetrator, otherwise known as the 14-tonne Bunker Buster Bomb. A mere 86 years after the first munitions were dropped from a biplane, the B-2 Spirit stands as an example of aviation innovation, with diverse technologies coalescing into a superior killing machine. From humble beginnings, they were soon adopted into service. Versatile pack mules, they changed the mobile nature of warfare before evolving into flying ambulances. Going where no fighter or bomber could go, these aircraft have endured war zones in the world's most seemingly inaccessible areas. Armoured and armed, the utility craft became the gunship, switching from lifesaver to deadly killer. 
delivering troops and equipment with pinpoint accuracy whilst carrying a battle-ready stock of guarded missiles, this legendary war machine is an essential military workhorse. The UH-60 Black Hawk Helicopter. On the 3rd of October 1993, the Black Hawk was deployed for Operation Gothic Serpent in Somalia. A US Joint Special Operations Force, led by eight Black Hawks, was sent into downtown Mogadishu to capture two warlords. The initial extraction was a success, but the task force came under heavy fire and two Black Hawks were shot down. The ensuing battle was the deadliest for US troops since Vietnam, with 18 soldiers killed and 76 wounded. But if not for the Black Hawk, the toll could have been higher. The pilot of downed Black Hawk Super 64 credited the superior crashworthy design of the UH-60 for saving his life. Since entering service with the US Army in 1979, Black Hawks have logged over 4 million flying hours. Able to carry 11 combat troops or haul 4 tons of equipment, the Black Hawk is the world's most advanced twin turbine battle helicopter. Its state-of-the-art flight instruments include an autopilot system, allowing the copter to fly itself. Defining rotorcraft versatility, the UH-60 Black Hawk has proved invaluable on the modern battlefield. A wartime legend, the salvation of hundreds of thousands of troops in one of the most brutal conflicts in history, it redefined military aviation. The single-engine, twin-blade Bell UH-1 Iroquois was introduced by the United States Army in 1959. When the US Army arrived in Vietnam to support the South against the communist Viet Cong, they brought with them a fleet of the untested Iroquois. Nicknamed the Huey and capable of speeds of over 200 kilometers per hour, its gas turbine engine made it lighter and more powerful than previous piston engine rotorcraft. The Huey was perfect for the dense jungle landscape of Vietnam, inaccessible to most vehicles. The flying horsemen of the United States Cavalry dismount for action. Able to fit six wounded on stretchers, the Huey was an essential lifeline. Over the course of the war, more than 150,000 US soldiers were injured, and the Huey played a major role delivering the wounded to care. The Viet Cong showed no mercy, and the medivac helicopters routinely came under heavy fire. The dangers for the crew were immense with the Huey's thin, lightweight aluminium body offering no ballistic protection. Crews would often place their personal body armour under their seats to shield bullets coming from below. If an attack took out the pilot and co-pilot, the Huey was equipped with a handle behind their seats, which when pulled would flatten their seats so their bodies could be rolled out, enabling another crew member to jump into position and take the reins. This gruesome yet essential feature illustrated the brutality of the Vietnam War and the resilience required to fight it. To provide essential fire support, many of the 7,000 Hueys that served in Vietnam were retrofitted with a variety of weapon systems, including a Gatling-style minigun capable of firing 6,000 rounds per minute. The Vietnam War had gone from the ground to the skies. The gunship was born, and in 1965, the 1st Air Cavalry Division was the premier cavalry unit to depend upon the helicopter. Tasked with searching out the Viet Cong, upon discovery, the Air Cavalry blasted them with lethal firepower. The Huey had arrived in Vietnam as a medical support tool, but after quickly displaying its resilience under fire, it became a combat weapon. Although production of the UH-1 halted in 1987, this Vietnam War hero, having flown more than 7.5 million combat assault sorties and nearly 4 million gunship attacks, will forever hold its place in history. 
As with most technologies, the early days of the helicopter yielded little success. Despite the setbacks, the goal was clear, achieving controlled vertical lift and flight. One of the biggest obstacles blocking rotorcraft design was torque reaction. An example of Newton's third law, where for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. With helicopter blades spinning one way, the body of the aircraft would simply be pushed in the opposite direction. Not until 1936, when German professor Heinrich Fokker unveiled his prototype FW61, did the world have what it considered to be the first fully functional helicopter. Fokker solved the torque reaction dilemma by employing two separate rotors spinning in opposite directions. Driven by a 160 horsepower engine, the counter-rotation of the rotors provided equilibrium at a starting lift rate of 206 metres a minute. The helicopter was born and it gave opportunity to all, including Germany's first female aviator and Iron Cross recipient, Hanna Reich. And astonishment takes the place of ridicule as the aircraft hovers and moves slowly round in the confined space, flown by a girl pilot, Hanna Reich. No mirrors or concealed wires aid this amazing performance. The helicopter, once just a fascinating folly, had become a reality, and it would dare to go where no other machine could. Fleeing a Russia ravaged by civil war, the father of the modern helicopter emigrated to the United States in 1919. Igor Sikorsky had originally studied engineering, but upon hearing of the Wright brothers' flight, he said, Within 24 hours, I decided to change my life's work. I would study aviation. After years of research into rotary wing flight, Sikorsky's first experimental machine, the VS-300 helicopter, took flight in September 1939. Igor Sikorsky, the veteran aircraft designer, breaking a record in his latest helicopter. For one hour, 32 minutes, 30 seconds, it went nowhere and stayed there. Powered by a 75 horsepower engine, it was the first successful single lifting helicopter in the United States. As a result of Sikorsky's success with the VS-300, that model was used as a prototype for the first helicopter designed for military use. Setting new records for helicopter speed, endurance and altitude, Sikorsky's R4 would become the world's first mass-produced helicopter. He embraced the need for helicopters in the military, constantly perfecting his new war machines. When Korea erupted into war in 1950, the United Nations came to the aid of the South. Although helicopters had been used in a limited capacity during World War II, the rough Korean terrain, often impenetrable by land vehicles, resulted in their widespread use. With the deployment of the Sikorsky H-19, helicopters impacted the mobile nature of war. The latest comes from the Korean front, where the hover machine has now become a rocket gun transporter. The idea is to fire at the enemy and then rapidly change position before the communists can locate them. A visionary, Sikorsky had foreseen the military application of the rotorcraft, delivering a revolutionary war machine. On January 17, 1991, the first shots fired in Operation Desert Storm came from the sky. Iraqi air defence towers were wiped out and the skies opened for 700 Allied fixed-wing aircraft to strike 500 strategic targets. Those first shots came from six Boeing AH-64 Apaches, the most advanced attack helicopters in the world. In 1986, after more than a decade in development, the US Army introduced the Apache, taking interactive military systems to a new level. The Combat Ready Apache is the most lethal helicopter in the world. Armed with 70mm armor-piercing rockets and laser-guided missiles, its nose-mounted sensor suite locates, tracks and attacks targets. A revolutionary helmet-mounted display system 
referred to by crews as the green-eyed monster, enables pilots to sink on board gun movements to the perspective of the helmet wearer. Potential targets need only be looked at before being fired upon. Wrapped in a titanium and Kevlar shell, the Apache is able to take an enormous amount of punishment and keep on flying at speeds nearing 300 kilometers an hour. The Apache employs infrared countermeasures that divert missiles away from the aircraft. The tandem cockpit is divided in two by bulletproof shielding, increasing crew survivability if one of the pilots is hit. The Apache has flown more than one million combat hours for more than 13 nations. With no plans for retirement anytime soon, the Apache's sophisticated technology and devastating weaponry will see it continue as a deadly force across the world's most unfriendly skies. A developing technology that still frustrates and excites in equal measure, the vertical and short takeoff, or V-style aircraft, is attempting to have it all. The vertical lift of a helicopter with the speeds of a jet. For decades, the world's most brilliant minds have tried to perfect the technology, pushing the laws of physics. The pursuit of fast combat aircraft that don't require runways has created some of the most revolutionary and sophisticated military machinery. In 1982, British Sovereign Territory was invaded for the first time in many years when Argentinian forces mounted an amphibious landing on the Falkland Islands. The British responded, deploying a fleet of strike fighters to support ground forces. The crisis would see the combat debut of the most successful family of V-style aircraft in history, the Harrier Jump Jet. Outnumbered 10 to 1 by the Argentinian air fleet, the Harriers flew over 2,000 sorties, including air-to-air -air combat, ground attack and reconnaissance. The Harriers were excellent dogfighters, but it was their V-style capabilities that provided the edge. Argentinian pilots had to fly long distances before reaching the engagement zone, leaving only 10 minutes before retreating or risk running out of fuel on their return to base. The Harriers, also with limited range, could take off and land almost anywhere, downing 20 enemy aircraft with no air-to-air -air losses. The Harrier's development began in 1957 when the Bristol Engine Company in England designed the vectored thrust Pegasus engine, allowing pilots to manipulate the orientation of the thrust, controlling the aircraft's angle and altitude. Together, aircraft and engine first flew in 1960. Six years and a series of redevelopments later, the Harrier jump jet family was finally born. Mastering the system is complex and pilots describe the flight controls as unforgiving. Most services require pilots to have extensive experience flying rotorcraft and fixed wing jets before undergoing Harrier training. After serving in conflicts around the globe, the production of the Harrier ended in 2003. They will retire from the battlefield by 2025, 60 years since their deployment began. During the 1956 revolution, Hungarian jets were dominating the Soviet occupying forces. In retaliation, the Red Air Force turned their attention to the Hungarian airfields, destroying runways and stopping the uprising in its tracks. The world was watching, and military strategists suddenly recognized the runway as the jet's Achilles heel. While helicopters don't require runways, they are subject to the unbreakable laws of physics. Even the most advanced rotorcraft has a built-in speed limit that, if exceeded, will spin the aircraft out of control. With speed and manoeuvrability vital to air supremacy, engineers turned their attention to developing vertical takeoff abilities in jet-powered aircraft. Launched in 1954, the British Rolls-Royce Flying Bedstead 
was one of the first VTOL aircraft to leave the ground. It may look like an optical illusion, but this thing is really flying. The bedstead will be used to study the problems of vertical takeoff and landings on, which may be applied in the future to high-speed aircraft. However, the bedstead's lift engines were redundant during forward flight, adding unnecessary weight. A solution emerged on the other side of the Atlantic. The Ryan X-13 was the first VTOL jet aircraft, taking off from a platform. It would then transition to a horizontal flight position before resuming its landing orientation. Two prototypes of the X-13 were built, but the US Air Force was unconvinced about the future of the technology. Over the next decade, a number of VTOL developments were made, but nothing came close to the speed of a combat jet, until Germany unveiled the VJ-101C. Designed by the father of the Messerschmitt fighter, the 101 was the first VTOL aircraft to break the sound barrier. With engine pods mounted on each wingtip, they could be swiveled 90 degrees. This taboo of thrust vectoring would be the key to the next generation of VTOL combat aircraft. In 1980, the United States Armed Forces attempted to rescue 52 embassy staff held captive in Iran. Eight sea stallions were deployed, but three suffered from critical failures and one crashed into a transport aircraft, resulting in a fire taking nine lives. The failed mission demonstrated the need for a new troop carrier not just capable of vertical precision landings, but endowed with speed and reliability. The Bell Boeing V-22 Osprey. In 2007, the Osprey entered active service when it departed for Iraq, on board an amphibious assault ship. While on board carriers, the Osprey's wings and rotors are folded to reduce valuable storage space. When it comes time for takeoff, the Osprey's horizontally positioned blades lift it from the carrier deck. As the aircraft gains speed, the blades are positioned for forward flight, turning the Osprey into a turboprop aircraft capable of 443 kilometers per hour. Transporting 24 combat troops or over 15 tons of cargo, the Osprey is relatively lightly armed. With the loading ramp lowered, a gunner can take their position. With the capabilities of a helicopter combined with the speed and range of a fixed-wing aircraft, the V-22 Osprey is perfect for precision operations. Designed with some of the most advanced stealth capabilities in the world, enemies of this aircraft may never know what hit them. A fifth-generation fighter jet designed for frontline combat it is as controversial as it is sophisticated. The Lockheed Martin F-35B Lightning, the world's first VTOL stealth aircraft, designed to be the primary tactical fighter for the US military. Its development process has, however, been plagued by setbacks, cost overruns, and technical difficulties. At 100 million US dollars per unit, the F-35 could be the most costly mistake in military aviation. Proponents of the F-35, however, maintain that it's worth every penny, a state-of-the-art killing machine that has no rival. The F-35B derives its takeoff thrust from a lift fan located behind the cockpit that ingests and expels air. The cruise engine exhaust is passed through a vectoring nozzle that can be deflected downward. This dual thrust system gives the F-35B twice the power of the second generation Harrier. The VTOL flight controls have been completely redesigned since the days of the Harrier. The F-35's systems are so advanced, the aircraft has been called a flying computer with cutting edge radar, avionics, communications and weaponry. Designed with the whole battlefield in mind, an interactive helmet allows pilots to see a 360-degree view of the skies, while the aircraft itself scans the air for hundreds of kilometres in every direction. 
providing the pilot with unprecedented situational awareness. With plans to launch in 2018 for the F-35, the sky appears to be limitless.